Welcome back to the Pacific Century, a Hoover Institution podcast on China, America, and the fate of the world in the 21st century. I'm your host, Misha Oslin, and it is a real pleasure today to be joined by uh, not just an historian and a scholar, but someone whom I uh, have admired and whose work I've admired for years, ever since I was, in fact, back in college and read his first book, co-authored, which was The Wise Men. And that, of course, for those of you who don't know, which I can't imagine is anyone, is Evan Thomas. Uh, Evan uh, is a graduate of Harvard University and University of Virginia Law School. He started off as a reporter at Time and then in 1991 joined Newsweek, where he reported for 24 years. But he is best known probably for his, not only his historical work, but in particular his group biographies. Again, starting uh, with The Wise Men, which was co-authored with Walter Isaacson, but um, books that uh, many of you know, including The Very Best Men, The Early Years of the CIA, um, Sea of Thunder for Naval Commanders in the Last Sea War, The War Lovers, Roosevelt, Lodge, Hearst, and The Rush to Empire, 1898, uh, and then a host of of single focus biographies, including on Eisenhower, Nixon, John Paul Jones, and Robert Kennedy, among others. So, in addition to being uh, one of the most prolific authors and historians we have today, uh, Evan is is just a, a wonderful person and and someone who is so uh, interesting to talk to, which is why I wanted to have him on today to talk in particular about his brand new book, Road to Surrender. Three Men and the Countdown to the End of World War II. So, Evan Thomas, welcome to the Pacific Century. Hi, hi, and thanks for having me. Well, it's it's great to uh, to do this publicly. Of course, we've met you know privately and been able to to talk. Uh, but I thought that given the book and the timeliness of the book Road to Surrender, um, it, it'd be a wonderful opportunity to to have you reflect a little bit on why you wrote this book now. Um, it, it focuses on the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Uh, and of course, for, you know, for historians and those who deal with Asia, this, this is not uncharted territory. Uh, people have written about the atomic bomb. They've written about the decision to drop the bomb. But you once again took on uh, a slightly different approach, which was the group biography, focusing on, on three critical individuals uh, during that period, the very last months of World War II, uh, which is, of course, Secretary of War Henry Stimson, Carl Tui Spatz, who was the head of our strategic bombing uh, arm in the Pacific, and I think perhaps most interesting, the Japanese foreign minister, Togo Shigenori, Togo being uh, his family name. Um, so before we get into your analysis of, of uh, the decision and some of the controversies that still arise from the decision, Evan, why did you write this book? Well, I had a personal connection. My uh, father uh, had been a junior officer on a LST, a landing ship tank that was on its way from Europe, where he'd been at D-Day and other uh, European theater things, and on his way to the Pacific for the scheduled invasion of Japan in the fall of 1945. And the the legend in my family always was that my sisters and I existed because of the atom bombs, because if there hadn't been those atom bombs, right. uh, he, he would have died. Uh, that's not totally far-fetched. There, there, there were war gaming that showed that uh, in the first day, a couple of hundred LSTs would be sunk. The Japanese had 7,000 kamikaze planes hidden in caves and around the landing beach at Kyushu. Then, you know, it was going to be, a, I think, Pretty well accepted a bloodbath. There's an argument over how big a bloodbath, but a big a big bloodbath. And that could have included my father. So that was always the family legend. But, you know, also growing up, as many of your listeners had, I had a pretty heavy dose uh, in school and college questioning why did we really do this? Uh, there's a whole school of scholarship that uh, Gar Alperwitz is the most famous member, but there are others who say, really, did we really have to drop those bombs? And did we have to drop two of them? And couldn't we have warned the Japanese somehow or negotiated a settlement? And that that question kind of gnawed at me for a long time. And uh, so that, that drew me into it. But really why I did this book 
was I'm interested in moral ambiguity. And I suspected from my earlier books that this was not a easy black and white, yes, no question. <clears throat> that even though the decision was to drop them, that didn't mean that the people who made those decisions had an easy time of it. I'm also a super interested in the Japanese side because you mentioned an earlier book I wrote called Sea of Thunder. And that was about the Battle of Leyte Gulf. And, and that I decided to do the Japanese side as well as the American side. It turns out that the Japanese side is in some ways more interesting than the American side. Because when you talk about moral ambivalence, it's so hard for us Westerners to get this. And I don't, I'm, I'm not an expert. I had a lot of help from Japanese people helping me with this. I'm, I'm a Westerner. I, you know, I'm, I don't claim super knowledge on this, but I did get it. I reached out to the Japanese side of the story and went to Japan and talked to people there. And, and I'm fascinated by moral ambiguity. And it was intense on both sides. Uh, with dropping the atom bomb, there really was not much of a decision there, really. Uh, but there was a lot of angst over it, uh, a lot of uh, private hand wringing. And so on the American side, I, I picked these characters who are very phlegmatic. And, and uh, you know, that in that generation, especially, never complain, never explain. You don't whine about what you're doing. There's no internet. They're not, you know, this is all before the me generation. <laughs> these, people are, <laughs> these people are all, don't be selfish. Don't even talk about yourself. But that doesn't mean they didn't worry. And so what I wanted to do is get at that. And in the case of Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, who really was really the chairman of the board of the atom bomb, he's he's a, the war secretary is running the Manhattan Project from afar, but he's he's running it. Uh, he in his diary, you know, he called it by its code name S1, but he also called it the awful, the terrible, the diabolical, a Frankenstein monster. He was just, you know, very upset about this. And I this really got my attention on the morning that he showed Harry Truman the photographs of what Hiroshima looked like after the bomb. So these are aerial photographs of the damage. What does Hiroshima look like? The inside of an ashtray. I mean, it's just, there's nothing left there. And Stimson that morning has a heart attack. Now he's 77 years old. He's got a heart condition. Maybe it's a coincidence, but I don't think so. You know, I, I think he was just traumatized by this. And he, I know he was guilty about it in later years. One of the reasons why the revisionists really dug in was that they saw Stimson's guilt about it. And they thought, whoa, if Henry Stimson's guilty about it, maybe we shouldn't have done it. Now, I, I think I show that we were going to do it anyways, no matter how much guilt he felt. And this is important. And it was the only real choice. Not a good choice, but the only real choice. So in looking at moral ambiguity, I wanted to do a military operator, you know, somebody who was involved in the delivery of the bomb. And I decided to do Tui Spatz, General Carl Spatz, who was the head of strategic bombing in the Pacific, but before that had done strategic bombing in Europe. And that interested me because in Europe, we killed a lot of civilians. And we didn't want to. We, we called it precision bombing. We said we were aiming at military targets and we tried to hit military, but we missed it, it, it the technology was imperfect the norden bomb site didn't work the germans were shooting at us the weather was bad you know we we killed a lot of civilians and on the night that we killed a lot of civilians which was when we bombed dresden in february 1945 a lot of your listeners will remember this the fire bombing of dresden it was both a british operation but also u.s Two nights after we bombed Dresden, Tui Spatz blew $1,700 on a poker game. That's the way he relieved the tension. He didn't, he didn't complain about it. You know, he didn't write whiny letters. He did complain to his wife a little bit, but, but you know, he just didn't know what else to do. So he blew two months salary on a poker game. I, I think that's, I think that's revealing. So one of the things that you do uniquely, I think, in this book uh, compared to some of the other books that have dealt with the question of of the bomb, uh, building it and, and using it, is, uh, as you've been intimating, though haven't explicitly said here, is that you're trying to get into the minds of these characters, but you're getting into their thoughts and words by using their diaries, by using letters, uh, by peeling back from the official, as you say, you know, sort of the office work, 
to the work at home. So whether it's it's Stimson and his wife, very close relationship, and it, as you said, one where he is he's in ill health, uh, spats trying to figure out how to blow off steam. What about Togo Shigenori? Um, very rarely do we get, I mean, obviously there have been books on the end of the war uh, from the Japanese perspective, but very rarely have we focused, I think, as as carefully as you do on one of the key Japanese antagonists. So maybe tell us, if you would, a little bit about him. Why, why'd you choose him? Why not Hirohito? Why not uh, Togo, someone else? Well, writing about Japan is especially challenging. For one thing, the Japanese don't believe in speaking ill of the dead. We say that, but they actually mean it. So in their post-war recollections, they write around a lot of their problems. Indirection is, for people who have studied Japan, been to Japan, they know that indirection is part of the culture. It certainly was in the 1940s. And uh, so that's a problem. I But I I, I focused on, on Togo and Shigenori, Togo Shigenori, to say it the Japanese way, uh, because he's the only member of the Supreme War Council, the people who actually run Japan. There's six people who basically run Japan, and they're military, all of them except for Togo. He's the foreign minister, war minister, chiefs of staff of the Army and Navy, but the one civilian is, is Togo. And he's a very interesting character to me because he, for one thing, he's anti-Nazi. That, that was interesting for a foreign minister. He thinks Hitler's a thug. Uh, he's not even J- Japanese. Well, he's 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 Korean by by blood. He changed his name. His family bought a samurai name. Their head name name had been Park. So he's a bit of an outsider. That's important because if you're an outsider, you're not totally drinking the Kool Aid, and you feel like an outsider. He 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 an admirer of German intellectual history. He's a little different. Also, and this makes him really different. He's blunt. He's straightforward. He says what's on his mind. That makes him very different from his peers. Now, he has a very difficult task, uh, and he's really the only guy doing it, trying to bring the Japanese government to surrender in the summer of 1945. There are others in the government, but he's the top guy who's trying to do it. And he puts himself at risk of assassination. Because if you're for surrender in Japan in 1945, the word surrender has been forbidden. You can't even use the word. And these young hothead colonels will kill you. It's not an idle threat. In Japan in the 1930s, I think two or three prime ministers were assassinated. There were famous assassination attempts. And there, there's graffiti in, Japan, in the walls of Tokyo. They want to kill uh, the, 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 what they call them, the, what do they call them? The, um, oh, they, they, use, they use this the Italian word. I'm suddenly forgetting it, but it means traitor. They're they're looking for traitors. Anybody who wants to surrender is a traitor. So the point is, he's at personal risk. So how do I get at this story? Well, I had the good fortune of finding his grandsons. And this is important in this kind of history, to to find family members. And in this case, one of the grandsons had his diary, which has never been published before. And it's in Japanese. I had had help from, from, from Kazu. Togo, uh, uh, who was a pretty westernized guy. He's a Japanese diplomat, has been ambassador to Netherlands, and so he's quite westernized. But but even so, there are problems of loss in translation, and I had a lot of help from an American, a guy named Brian Walsh, who is a, a Princeton PhD. Uh, he teaches in Japan. He teaches history in Japan. His wife is Japanese, and he acted as my translator, but also my interpreter uh you know you don't there can be a lot of lost in translation here and so we would have these zoom calls between uh, kazu we also got his twin shigi on the phone on the on the zoom and brian and we would talk through uh really trying to understand uh togo shigenori's diary or you know what he meant what he's thinking and that's that you have said getting into the head that's uh, that is what i'm trying to do it's tricky but with the diary, those are, those are imperfect devices. I'm sure your readers will understand this. People write diaries for lots of reasons. They're not always honest. You know, they can be written for the record or for history, or so you have to be careful with it. But but you know, the best I did the best I can with his grandsons interpreting his diary, uh, and it it is a record. It's an important record, and it showed his own angst over all this, how exhausted and worn he was by this nearly futile attempt to bring around the 
the Japanese government. He succeeds finally because the emperor of Japan, Hirohito, who's been a tool of the military through most of the war, finally gets fed up with his own generals. They wanted the, 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 the key moment is a few months before the bomb in June, when the military wants to move the emperor up into the mountains to a, their redoubt, to a palace. Now, I don't think really it's a palace, to a bunker, really. And they've got an armored train to take him there. And the emperor says, no, this is new. The emperor defying the military. This is an unusual move. And it shows he's finally getting sick of these generals who are taking this country down the road to perdition. And it's tricky for him because he's afraid of a coup and not that he would be killed, but he would be essentially become the captive of the military or be replaced by one of his brothers. That could also happen. In any case, the emperor is starting to have some distance from the military. The other big factor is the atom bomb. The atom bomb falls on Hiroshima and this, you know, the emperor thinks, you know, are they coming for me next? They do hear, they, his entourage tells him that they're hearing the radio signals of the 509th Composite Group, the Air Force group that dropped the atom bomb. They hear their signals, they're in the air again, and the emperor is worried. The Air Force has already burned his palace by mistake in May when we were firebombing Tokyo, not intentionally aiming at the palace, but the firestorm jumped the moat and burned down a number of buildings in the palace grounds. So the point of this is that emperor is afraid of it for his own safety and he's worried that the atom bomb is coming coming for him and that finally br helps bring him around uh to surrender the, the records on this are spotty uh the japanese have never fully revealed the record of the emperor they sort of dole it out bit by bit but there's some recent stuff there's a chamberlain who has uh, talked about what i've just finished talking about that he was worried about the atom bomb there's a uh, a story named Rich Frank, who's probably known to some of your listeners, uh, who's on to this and and uh, writing a very long three volume work on the Pacific War. And he told me about this uh, Chamberlain who has this re recent stuff about the, the So the point is I'm piecing together bits and pieces from diaries and recollections to tell this story that has been told in various ways, but not quite as uh, directly as I do. And also not for a popular audience. You know, one thing I'm doing right. here is I'm, 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 not, I'm not writing academic history. I'm writing for a popular audience. I have to be accurate and I have it vetted by academics. And I, I'm careful. I got a lot of footnotes, but I'm writing and I'm writing. I, I, I actually ended up writing a thriller. I didn't set out to. I, it's about half the length of one of my usual books. And what happened was I decided to write in the present tense to make it mm -hmm. more immediate and that made it move along fast and i and the story itself was more thrilling than i realized because again it's the japanese side i didn't realize how close it was how close they came to not surrendering that was that's really has not been brought out well in other books rich frank gets at it some others get at it but i that that's the the heart of my book is this kind of thrilling last couple of weeks when it's not you know you know we won the war. We dropped the bomb. But in a way, it's you don't know. It's thrilling. You sort of can't believe how, what a close run thing it is. Well, I think there's that's, that's exactly uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up. Two things. One is exactly that, which is, yeah, of course, you know, if you're an academic and you've you've studied it, you know that uh, even after uh, the the bombs were dropped, there was questions within the high councils and the Supreme War Council: Would they surrender? Would, would they not? Could they keep fighting? Uh, but you you really bring that to life in a way that um, I think shows that there really there really was no other option, meaning that, you know, for all the questions about the peace feelers through the Russians or the peace feelers through the Swiss, uh, that they were hopelessly deadlocked. And even after Hirohito had pretty well made clear yeah. his own desires that the war end, they still dragged it on. So this was not by any means a sure thing leading back to that question of did we actually have to do it yeah. yeah this is an important point because in the revisionist school the united states has broken the japanese diplomatic code and they we intercept these messages that make it clear, pretty clear the emperor is saying you know i want peace but if you look closely at the decoded messages 
at, at the dialogue between Togo, my guy, the foreign minister, and the Japanese ambassador to Moscow, who's supposed to go to the Russians and get the Russians to mediate a peace uh, effort, it's pretty clear from the decoded messages that it's somewhat of a half-hearted attempt uh, that in the Japanese ambassador says, look, you know, you're not going to you're not going to get this unless you agree to unconditional surrender. And that's and Togo says, no, we're not doing that. And why? Because the War Council doesn't want to do unconditional surrender. What do they want? They 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 know they've lost the war. It's not like the Japanese think they're going to win. They know that they've lost. Their fleet has been sunk. Uh, but what they want is to force an invasion that will be so bloody that the Americans finally say, enough, no mas, and, and give them what they really want. What do they really want? No American occupation. And no war crimes trials, because remember, who's going to be hung in the war crimes trials but the you know, Japanese military leaders. So the guys making the decision know the noose is around their neck. So they want no war crimes trials and they want to keep the emperor and they want all those three things. And they think that it's not crazy. It's not really irrational. They think if they can make us bleed enough, they'll get that. So that's why they want to force an invasion. The atom bombs change the equation. Because they can they can beat and they can have a bloody invasion. But if we just keep dropping atom bombs on them, that's not an invasion. That's just the, the fairly quick death of all of Japan. So there's a squabble. How many bombs do we have? Do we have more than one? Well, actually, it turns out we do because we drop a second bomb. But even after the second bomb, there's a scene. The War Council's meeting and word comes to them. Hiroshima, not just Hiroshima, but now a second bomb, a Hiroshima-style bomb, has just taken out Nagasaki. And what does the war minister, the most powerful man in the room, Anami, uh, uh, Anami, General Anami, he's the war minister, what does he say? He says, wouldn't it be beautiful if the whole nation was to die like a flower? This is the way they talked. Now, he's blustering for his subordinates, who he's, he doesn't want to get killed by them either, uh, so some of this is bluster, but the point, they're tied that the, the war council is not voting to surrender even after the second bomb. It's divided. It's a three to three deadlock. In order to get anything done in Japan, you have to have a consensus. So the war council is deadlocked. So it's going to just drag on. Fortunately, emperor that night finally comes around and says, no, I agree with Togo. I agree with the foreign minister. We're going to surrender. Are we done? No. Because the message that goes to Washington says, okay, we surrender, but the emperor has to be sovereign. Well, the message gets to Truman and Stimson and Burns, the secretary of state, and they go, whoa, 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 wait a second. You can't have a sovereign. You can't preserve the Japanese imperial system. That's got to go. So we send a message back saying, okay, well, great, you accept your surrender, but the emperor is not going to be sovereign. It's going to be subject to the Supreme Allied Commander. You know, they don't want the emperor reporting to God. He's a deity. They want him reporting to Douglas MacArthur. Well, this they were back at square one because the Japanese can't accept that. They can't accept the emperor losing their sovereignty. So this rattles on for four or five more days. And meanwhile, a coup attempt is launched. And I know, you know the war minister half goes along with it. It's unclear uh, what his motivations are. And I think he's deeply ambivalent. I spoke earlier about moral ambivalence, which is a big theme of my book. Uh, Anami, I think, is ambivalent. He doesn't want to cross the emperor, but on the other hand, he doesn't want to surrender. So he kind of half encourages this nutty coup attempt. But it's not that nutty because while Anami commits suicide, Harry Carey takes his sword and plunges it in his stomach because what else is he going to do? These crazy colonels kill the head of the imperial guard and they forge orders giving them control of the palace and the night before the emperor's scheduled surrender speech there are soldiers running through the imperial palace trying to find the recording of his speech of the emperor's speech so they can break it so that he can't there won't be a speech we're back if that happens we're back in you know who knows civil war uh military government I mean, who knows it's just complete chaos Fortunately, the soldiers cannot find the recording. It's hidden in a room reserved for the 
<laughs> ladies in waiting to the empress. You can't make this stuff up. You know, it's a, it's a movie. Uh, and the, the chief plotter at that point is a young colonel. He goes out and he shoots himself. And finally they surrender. And the emperor gives his famous address saying the war is not going as well as anticipated. They've been nuked in two days. For, I mean, ten, twice, in, twice in 10 days. So it's a very close run thing. And my book, I think, captures the drama of this. One thing that you talk about that, honestly, I, I had... I'd like to think I had forgotten it, meaning I did know it at some point, but I honestly am not sure I did. You know, we've always been told we only had two bombs. We used the two bombs. If the Japanese hadn't surrendered, we were out of Schlitz. We had nothing more to use to force them into a surrender. And yet you talk about a third bomb. So when I first read that, I thought, ah, you know, I got him. The mistake, there's no way. I, I, you know, I know this period. And you go through and you talk about the preparations that were going on, uh, General Groves, who was the the operational head of, of the Manhattan Project, preparing a third bomb that they thought uh, would be ready uh, within the fall. And the target for that most likely would have been Tokyo. And you go through some of those debates. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I think, to me, that was, that was actually new. Yeah. Uh, I, I, this is not, I, remember, I'm a journalist here. I'm not making new academic discoveries and I don't want to claim to. Uh, so uh, it's been other scholars have unearthed the record that shows there was a third bomb that would have been ready by August 20th, actually pretty soon, not just the fall, but August 20th. Yeah. And initially Truman gets Truman is so shocked. He gives control of the control to the military over dropping the bomb. It, it, the order goes out initially saying bombs is made ready four targets. But then when Truman sees the photographs of what Hiroshima looks like, he takes con civilian control back. No, 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 no. No more bombs. He doesn't even know about the Nagasaki bomb. That goes off. He doesn't know the timing of it. That goes off. Now he's got civilian control again, the president's control. He says no more bombs. So they stop the transmission of the, or the sending of the third bomb is actually halted for a couple of days. And then they're getting ready to resume it again because the Japanese are not surrendering. So they would have had a third bomb ready for delivery on about August 20th. Where? Well, my character, General Spots, and his buddies out at Tinian are picking, want to pick a, the next target, Tokyo. Now, that sounds a little grimmer than it is because they don't mean to drop it on the palace. After all, somebody's got to surrender here. They're not trying to kill the emperor. They want to drop it on a burned out area. There's a lot of burned out Tokyo, maybe 20 square miles, maybe even more. So the thinking is do it as a kind of a demonstration. So uh, what they call the scare radius, uh, the flash and the boom is big enough, loud enough. So the emperor and his, his government can see how terrible a third bomb now this one. Now we got three uh, and that that would force them into surrender. And Truman we know this from a document that's in the, from the British archives. On, on the day before the Japanese surrender, the, the, the official surrender, Truman is meeting with the uh, with British diplomats and, and interestingly, the, the, the uh, uh, Duke of Windsor, uh, who's in Washington. And he says, he says, according to the British document, he says, sadly, he says, I'm, we're going to have to drop a third atom bomb on Tokyo. And that is five hours before they get word the Japanese has finally surrendered, this time for real. So that bomb never gets dropped. But, you know, it's even worse than that, because there's also a record that General Marshall, the sainted General Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, is thinking, you know, the Japanese are not surrendering here. We're going to have to invade after all. Marshall's thinking about tactical nuclear bombs using uh, nine nuclear bombs on the beaches of Kyushu. Uh, it's sort of hard to believe. We would have had, I, I think we would have had about seven ready by the day of the invasion, November 1st, but maybe would have had a couple more. In any case, he's asking for nine uh, atom bombs. He asked, how is this going to work? And they say, well, the invading forces should lay back for 48 hours uh, before we go over. Uh, you know, I, I, they didn't understand radiation as well as they should have. I think there was some willful denial on this. 
Uh, there's some very good scholarship on this. Uh, Sean Malloy is uh, very good on this. Um, is sowing a kind of a willful denial by Opp not just by the military, but by Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer is not as curious about radiation and the effects of radiation as he might be. Why? Because I think he wants to drop this bomb. He wants to hmm. do this demonstration and show the world. This is not in the movie. They don't really get into this, but there's a lot of evidence. And again, there's a scholar named Sean Malloy who's gotten into this. Uh, that they should have known more about radiation than they did. And uh, Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project, he covers it all up. But Oppenheimer's in cahoots. Not just Oppenheimer, but President Conant of Harvard uh, is not as curious about the effects of radiation as he might have been. I'm pretty sure that's because they didn't want to have a big discussion about poison. You know, poison gas had been proved awful in World War I and had not been used in World War II. And they and I, the people making the bomb did not want to get into a big discussion about radiation because it's like poison gas. And so they kind of skipped past the risks. They knew the risks, but they minimized them. And then when they were confronted with radiation poisoning in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they were kind of in denial for a while. It's actually fascinating. Um, and, and again, something that I myself I'm not that familiar with. To play devil's advocate for a second uh, on an, on another issue, though, you saying that, interestingly, almost could be used to give credence to the argument that we were thinking about these bombs for an incipient Cold War, meaning, right, there was an international agreement after World War One never to use poison gas again. And, uh, uh, you know, the argument is Hitler adhered to it. In World War II, because he was a victim of poison gas, right? A poison gas attack in World War One. So even he, bizarrely, even for Hitler, poison gas was was too much, at least on the battlefield. Obviously, not against civilians and Jews and in the concentration camps. So if the same dynamic had taken place, a radiation poisoning, it's a horrible thing. We're going to ban the use of the bomb, but why wouldn't you want to ban the use of the bomb only if you see its utility in post-war? A post-war environment. Yeah. There, there's a division, I think, on this. The person who's thinking the most about uh, the atom bomb and Russia is Secretary Jimmy Burns. He wants to use it as a diplomatic weapon, a kind of a like a pistol in your pocket to intimidate the Russians. And I think he does think that way. And I think Truman does a little bit as well. Uh, Stimson is more ambivalent. He he he. The, in his diary, he says, "Oh, this is our Mastercard." But uh, but he changes his mind. He initially thinks, oh, we can use this to threaten the Russians, maybe to make the Russians liberalize. But then he decides after after we've dropped a couple of these bombs, he just says, no, we need to bring the Russians into the tent, share the secret with them and have some arms control. He gives the first ever arms control speech to the Aussable Club. And I think it's early September 1945, right around the time of the Japanese surrender. He makes a plan to share the bomb with Truman. He shows it to him in September and Truman rejects it. And uh, the arms race is on. Uh, why did, does Truman reject it? I, I don't, it's not all that unreasonable in the sense that the, the idea that Stalin is going to allow inspectors in the Russia is far-fetched. The Russians are building their own bomb. I don't think they're going to share with us. I, I would, I'm, I'm torn by this. I'd like to think, you know, if only the United States had proposed to the Russians uh, arms control, Right away, nuclear freeze, basically, international control, the whole world would have been better. I'd like to think that. But I, at the same time, not that I'm a Russian expert, I have a hard time seeing Stalin agreeing to this sort of freeze and agreeing to allow Western inspectors in. It's just so un-Russian to do that, especially since they had stolen the secret of the bomb and were building their own, which they had Within four years, by 1940. And, and we hadn't told them at all about the bomb preparations no. officially during, so they, they, you know, they already felt, well, you can't, we can't trust them. They're you not going to share with us. They trusted us anyways. Neither side trusted right. the other. So right. I think realistically, I don't think arms control could have happened. I say that with re regret and I, 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 I find this a difficult subject uh, to know for sure. This is all historical counterfactuals and those are always hard. Uh, but I, I doubt, I don't think we could have trusted the Russians and they wouldn't have trusted us. One thing I wanted to um, 
uh, go back to just very briefly because we we overlook it, um, and yet it's an indication of just how revolutionary and transformative the the atomic bomb was. Um, you mentioned, of course, that that Truman initially said to the army, "As soon as you get them, use them," uh, in the Army Air Forces. And then he saw the devastation of Hiroshima and took control. Now we we take that for granted today, but I think it's worth remembering that never in American history had an American president taken personal, meaning in his position, civilian control of a weapon. Of course, he was commander in chief, you know, sends the army and the navy, but he actually took control of this weapon and without much of a fight. I mean, whether that's because of the strength of the Constitution or because everyone understood how unique this was, I just think it's worth yeah. remembering that, that that if it had gone differently, we could have had the military in charge of the weapon. Yeah, no, it's it, it, Truman himself is somewhat ambivalent about it. Uh, he later talked about how it was my decision and, you know, I never lost a minute's sleep about it. But I think the evidence is that he did lose some sleep about it. And one bit of evidence is that he, just as you say, he took control of it. Having given the military control, he took it back. And he kept control. The, the Atomic Energy Commission kept control of those bombs. They didn't give them back to the military, I believe, until Korea. Is that right? I, 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 th I think that I think the AEC had control of those bombs until the Korean War. They didn't transfer the, the actual physical control of the weapons back to the military until the Korean War. And even, no, 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 and, and even then... Him. The chief executive kept control over the decision, over the usage. Over the usage. That's right, yeah. right. And and you have, um, you know, the the famous, you know, anecdotes of uh, of Douglas MacArthur uh, stating this this changes war forever. Uh, Bernard Brody, the 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 naval theorist who becomes our really our first atomic theorist, who says, you know, up until now the whole point of of um, of building weapons has been to prepare to fight wars now we have to prepare not to fight wars that's the whole point of the military because we have we have the nuclear weapon uh that that this really was transformative and as since we're getting uh, towards the end I'd actually uh, of the interview I'd actually like to to begin transitioning if we could towards the present um you know your book brings to life a, a period of history that, Many there are still people who remember. They remember the first reports of the bomb. They certainly remember the early days of, of um, uh, of the atomic age. And you know those people are getting fewer and fewer. But we also, since the end of the Cold War, have largely, at least in this country, sort of put the nuclear question back in the the bottle, the genie back in the bottle. You know, Doctor Strange Love has folded up the tent. Um, but that's not how the world has acted no, in many fortunately. ways. Fortunately, I mean, I'm certainly of that generation. We're back in a nuclear world. We, I hate it. I mean, you know, I was I grew up with duck and cover gr drills and all that, and I was right. so relieved in 1989, 1990, 1991 when the genie went back in the bottle. Well, it's out again, and yes. it's kind of unstable, scary way because the Russians have talked about tactical use of tactical nuclear Putin is. Uh, uh, using tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Let's hope he doesn't do it. It's a terrible military weapon. But, you know, I'm actually more worried about the Pacific theater because the war game scenario there that I think is all too plausible is that though some kind of naval engagement happens over Taiwan or just over freedom of the seas. But anyways, we get into a sea fight with China. And the problem, and, and you probably know more about this than I do, but but I, I believe that China has land-based missiles that they would mm -hmm. use to sink our ships. Uh, yes. And and so they are shooting at us from their land base. So what do we do? We take out their land-based missile sites. Now the United States of America is attacking Chinese mainland. So what's the next step? Well, not it wouldn't be crazy to use a tactical nuclear weapon against the American fleet, for the Chinese to use a tactical nuclear weapon against the American fleet. Now we are into what they, what they euphemistically call limited nuclear war. I, I have my doubts about whether you can fight a limited nuclear war. I, I have these doubts just because it seems crazy to me, but also because uh, Dwight Eisenhower has. I wrote a book about Dwight Eisenhower who never really, you know, there was in the 50s, people started talking about limited nuclear war and the think tanks at Rand and, and Herman Kahn and all that and game theory. And, and, and I remember Eisenhower never really bought that. He, you know, he thought, if you start these wars, it's you're all in. And he would bluff. I wrote a book called Ike's Bluff 
about Eisenhower's bluff with nuclear weapons because he was an all in guy. Either you fight with these all the way or don't or don't. I mean, or don't even tempt fate. Do not get into an engagement that can escalate into a nuclear war. I have this fear now about the Pacific that we could get into a military engagement that would tempt fate by tempting the Chinese to use a tactical weapon against our fleet. And then who knows? For one thing, you've got cyber. So while all this is going on, they're knocking out satellites. What's going to stop the Chinese from turning the lights out in the United States? I, I, people have not come to grips with these scenarios that are scary as all hell. It's not some nice little 19th century naval battle of ships shooting at each other that we're getting into. We're shooting at mainlands and they, they, the cyber attacks on the United States. For one thing, the economy goes to hell right away because stock market collapses. I mean, you know, a, a war with a war with China is going to be a really ugly, scary thing. It, you know, I'm not saying doomsday, although you can get to doomsday. Uh, but you know, these these scenarios are very these scenarios are very frightening for sure. And you um. You know, you raise uh, and and questions that back then they really had no idea about. So, for example, uh, you don't have to set off a tactical nuclear weapon against our forces, but you could set off an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse, with a nuclear weapon in the atmosphere. Now, how do we how do we respond to that? And if we don't respond, does that embolden them? There's other scenarios. By the way, you brought up the the question of us attacking their their land based missiles uh, to protect not just our ships but our bases in the region in Japan, on Guam, uh, perhaps South Korea. Um, there are scenarios where where the the most assured way of doing that is by launching our own missiles, you know, not just from planes, but ballistic missiles. Where if you're the Chinese and you see a ballistic missile coming in, do you wait to make sure it's conventional and not nuclear before you decide to launch yours? So you're, I, you know, you're exactly right. I think to to raise this question of of the uncertainties uh, in the Pacific. Perhaps approximately, it's more worrisome in Ukraine right now, but over. Uh, over the long run. Uh, and these are, as you point out, scenarios that we simply um, haven't fully thought through. I mean, hopefully there are some people doing it. But what's so interesting then to go back to the book uh, as we as we begin to finish up is, of course, that was a nuclear monopoly, an atomic monopoly yeah. that the United States had for four years. Yeah. And so when you talk about Stimson and, and Truman and Oppenheimer and Groves and Burns and all of them, you know, that was that was the the royal flush of all royal flushes. You know, you don't get anything better. It, and yet it was forget. ephemeral. Yeah. Yeah. People forget. I mean, there's no there was no risk of escalation in 1945 because we were the only people who had the bomb. Now, nine countries have bombs and our immediate foes, Russia and China, they got bombs. Iran could have a bomb soon. I mean, you're in a, you're in an escalatory. World which didn't exist in 1945. It does now. And it behooves us to think about that. In fact, I'm a little surprised that we're not thinking about it more, that this is not more a question, a public question that is debated in, uh, in, in, in either the think tank world, uh, which you're familiar with, or maybe, maybe it is, maybe I just, I'm, I'm not well enough educated. And I, I do know there is, I do know there is some talk about this in the scholarly journals, but I, I just, I'm surprised there's not more talk about it. Well, I think it's I think uh, that's exactly right. There are people that talk about it, but it's the same thing that happened to Russian studies after the Cold War. We sort of closed up shop on the nuclear question, assuming we didn't have to worry about it. And we didn't train mm. a new generation of nuclear thinkers for 30 years. There were some, of course, there, there, there were some, um, but not like how we did during the Cold War, nor did we do it in a way that the nuclear question was intimately related to every strategic question we discussed because we understood that ultimately it could come into play. Yeah. And after 1989, 1991, we just figured, well, we didn't have to think about that. And you're right. So I think it's it's a loss of muscle memory. It's a loss of, of institutional intellectual capacity, which we have to build up. And while there are some, there are some attempts at that, and we, you know, we talk about war games and the like, um, I think that a lot of it is done with a sort of post-1992 mindset, not a post-45 mindset, where you very quickly had a pure competitor, the Soviet Union, that could deliver missiles or could deliver bombs and then had missiles. But I think we we sort of take it with the, well, we've got such overwhelming power 
that we don't have to really worry about this. So I think in a lot of ways, it is worth going back to the book uh, and the angst questions, the moral ambiguity that you raise um, as, as starting points to talk about how do we ensure that this never happens? They were dealing with it, as you point out, because in essence, it had to happen. They needed to use it. But we need to think about how you never need to use it, but with the same sets of questions. So to leave to leave us then, is there anything from the book, Evan, that you would say um, is the most important lesson if there's if if there's one that you can draw out for us today? Is there one or or is it just it's so overwhelming that you sort of have to take it in its own totality? I you know, I don't have it. There's no great moral. Uh, 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 bottom line here, there's a wish that our leaders will be serious about this and think about it uh, in a more serious way than, and, you know, politics is a joke right now. It's pathetic. And uh, uh, it's almost amusing, but it's all, it kind of darkly amusing. And uh, uh, we need, uh, you know, I, this is kind of sounds ridiculous, but I need more serious leaders. <laughs> That's sort of pathetic to say that, but we need more serious leaders who are thinking this way. Now, having said that, I think at the presidential leader level, they may not be so serious. Uh, that's not fair, actually. Uh, uh, Trump is a joke. Uh, uh, but Biden, Biden has been around the track a few times. Uh, I, I shouldn't be so, uh, 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 I shouldn't be so critical of him. But I, our general political discourse today, our public discourse is laughably uh, naive and and uh, uh, and it focuses on things that are not not the things that are going to kill us. Uh, you know, uh, we need to be more focused on uh, on the questions that we're talking about. Well, if anything, that 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 brings into even starker relief uh, the character of someone like Henry Stimson, the the core. Yeah. The central figure yeah. in your book. Yeah, yeah. You know, I hope that, we have some good. I mean, if our, I hope our presidents this is obvious, but have some serious people. I, you know, I think Jake Sullivan's a serious person. I, I don't. I don't mean to say they're not. And I think Trump has had uh, even in Trump's presidency, he had some decent people advising them. I'm not sure in a second Trump presidency if he would. I'm not sure who those people are. In the first Trump presidency, he did have some some serious uh, and good people. Uh, but let's hope if Trump wins, he does it again. I, 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 it's hard to even imagine, to tell you the truth. Well, that's that's why I think the the value of going back and looking at at you know that's what history does for us, right? It, it shows as you've done as you have done through eleven books, uh, shown uh, you know people, uh, mostly men, and given the the periods that you're dealing with, but people who dealt very carefully and soberly and seriously with questions, and and honestly, none perhaps as grave as that of the atomic bomb. So I think that's a good point to, to, to wrap it up. And, and um, again, the book is Road to Surrender. Uh, the author, Evan Thomas, most of you have read at least one, if not more of his books. Uh, I urge you to get this one uh, as well. And Evan, it has been a great pleasure having you on the Pacific Century. Thanks, Michael. I really enjoyed it. So for the Pacific Century, I'm Misha Oslin, it's been, uh, as always, great to have you with us, and we will see you next time. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we generate and promote ideas advancing freedom. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts, or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.